Welcome all of you. Uh, we will have uh, today our uh, guest, uh, Miss uh, uh, Miss Nancy. So Miss Nancy George is our uh, guest today. Who come all the way from uh, Dubai to uh, talk to us about something that we are very interested to learn more. We have last week lecture uh, by uh, Dr. Radha, and this way, this one is another uh, one about ABA and how we apply ABA and how we use it for treatment and all these kind of things. So I will just give a brief. Uh, there is a long, long, long CV for uh, Miss Nancy, uh, but which I don't know a lot of them. But she's a, a board certified behavioral analysis and. Uh, Qualified Behavioral Analysis and IEPA, International Behavioral Analysis, that bring with her about 11 years of experience dealing with people and behaviors. In the last five years in the field, she has been between Kuwait and Dubai, and she's currently leading a big team at uh, Sanad um, Village, which is basically deal with uh, children with special uh, need. She has under her uh, supervision about 28 uh, EBA uh, therapist. And uh, thank you, Ms. Nancy, and thank you for coming to us. Hello. The microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Um, the video is not on, right? No, well, no. Yeah, but uh, they will hear you better if you say. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today. So we won't let the hype about ABA, ABA, ABA is the it thing for mental health disorders. How do we treat, how do we make our kids get better? ABA. Um, so what exactly is ABA is what we're gonna look through today. So today by the end of the presentation, I'm gonna be covering four topics basically, like how did ABA come about? The history of ABA. Why does a child do what he does? How do we do ABA? A lot of questions that people ask, like, what do you guys do in ABA? How do you bring about this difference? And then, yes, okay, now everything's all right. How do we know it works? Give me the numbers. So starting with, this is just a very brief history of how ABA came about. So in 1913, John B. Watson, um, he, started, he started with the book, Psychology as a Behaviorist Views. It moved on to 1924 with Canton. He published Principles of Psychology and he went on with 20 more books in the next 60 years. In 1932, B. F. Skinner and Open Conditioning came into effect. 1938, B. F. Skinner and Behavior of Organisms. 1953, B. F. Skinner and Ogden Lindsay, they started the Behavior Research Laboratory. And in 1998, finally, the BSEB or the board or the Behavior Analyst Certification Board came into effect, and then officially the RBTs, the BCBAs, the BCABAs and BCBADs came into effect. So we in ABA work on certain principles. So we basically call it the function. So any behavior that a person does basically has four functions. For example, the reason why you sit that way has a function. You feel more comfortable sensory field. If you are fiddling with your phone, that has a function. Again, sensory field. When he is on his phone, again, there's a trying function. Trying to fix it, yeah. <laughs> there's a function. So he's trying to gain something. Similarly, <coughs> excuse me, every behavior that a person does has a function. You can never say, I don't know why he did that. Of course you would know. And how do we work about it? The four functions, we call it sensory escape attention and access. Sensory is, you know, when we sit, sometimes we keep shaking our legs or tapping our legs like this, or we thumb our fingers. There's no visible reason why we do it, but it gives us a sensory feel. And that's when we say sensory. So when we talk about children with special needs, you know, some of them keep doing this, some of them keep jumping around, especially kids who are diagnosed with ADHD, they cannot stand still. They just keep jumping around or murmuring or humming all around. That's sensory. Second, escape. So, if I don't want to be here, and this is a really boring presentation, what would I do? Oh, I've got a call, and you walk out, right? Please feel free, if you have a call, please feel free to go out. We're not going to hold you, hold any grudges against you, but that's an example of escape. I don't want to be with a person, 
and I'll be like, yes, I'm gonna get back right now. Or I don't want to be in a room where um, the teacher is trying to teach me continuously. What am I going to do as a student? Put a cry, scream, throw a tantrum probably. She'll be like, out, out of the class. What do I get? The escape that I need. The third one, attention. So there are appropriate for all these behaviors, for all these functions, there are appropriate ways and inappropriate ways to get attention. The appropriate ways to get attention are, you know, calling the name, maybe texting and saying, hey, um, I need to get this from you, or, or, you know, just tapping someone when they walk. And what are the inappropriate ways? Well, to just the usual, the crying, the screaming, the yelling, or um, again, something that we do as fun, when you walk by just a whack on the head and things like that, that's again for attention. Access when you want something. The proper way to get access to something is either to walk towards it and get it by yourself or ask for it in whatever ways you can. Verbal, you can text for something that you want. You can ask for something that you want. You can sign for something that you want. You can show a picture of something what you want. So these are the four functions. So in ABA, anything that any living organism does has a function. Now, the next part is the plan, the process, the precision. How do we work? So initially, when a child, again, our starting point are doctors, people like you, developmental physicians, um, clinical psychologists, mental health specialists, people who are authorized to do a um, diagnosis. We as BCBAs or as ABA therapists cannot diagnose. We are not authorized to diagnose. We are allowed to design programs to help with the treatment plan, but we cannot diagnose. So in ABA, what do we do first when a child comes in? Okay, after the diagnosis, the child comes and sees us. We have a quick recommendation after, um, after being with the child for maybe about half an hour to one hour we would suggest a quick recommendation. Now this quick recommendation might not always be accurate. Why? Because there's no way that you can possibly see all the, or all the skills that a child has in the first half an hour or first one hour that you see. So the magic really happens once the child joins an ABA program. So how we work is the ABC data analysis. For the first two weeks, we continuously keep taking data on everything that a child does. Oh, he did this and he did that. He did this for this long and for this, this much detail or with this much intensity. I will explain all that in the coming uh, pages. And then we create the BIP or the Behavior Intervention Protocol, which tells us what to do when a child does this for this reason. And consistently, the child keeps getting this input over and over again throughout all different people, throughout all different locations, and then it starts, behavior starts to change. The third is when we start with the skills assessment and the ITP. So the skills assessment is very vast, it's very, very vast. So there are different assessment programs that we can use. For example, Weavy Map is the starting point. You have EFL, EFL Essentials of Living, you have AFOs, you have ABLES, they speak. There's so many assessments. Again, it depends on the child and the skills level and also what the parent wants you to work on is based, that is the basis of which one you select. What do you select? Which program, which assessment? Next is the implementation of the design program. And does it stop there? No, that's the starting. When you start implementing, you start taking data continuously and this data is drawn into graphs and we analyze, is it working? Mm, maybe not, okay, what do we change? We change this part, is it working? Yes, it's working now. Now, to give you a detail of the whole thing that I've been talking about, this is the start point. So this is called the ABC data analysis. In ABC data analysis, it means A, B, C. A is for antecedent. What happens before a behavior? And C is consequence. What did the environment around this child do once the child had this behavior? An example, 11, 11, 22, at 10.30 a.m., NG, which is me, Nancy George, is sitting on the chair in class 132. NG is sitting across from this particular child. What was the antecedent? I take an apple, I keep it on the table, and I ask the child, what color is this? What does the child do? He grabs the apple with the right hand, throws it at NG, holds the table with both hands, flips the table over, and bangs the head backward at the wall 12 times. 
So you can literally see what happened in your head, right? So when you write ABC data, this is what is what the intention is. Because as BCBAs, we might not always be in a position to be with the child. We do not see what happened exactly. So it is this data that we receive from our therapist who works directly with the kids that helps us decide what happened and why is the child doing something. So what was the consequence? NG quickly holds a pillow below the head to soften the blow without giving the child eye contact. Now, and NG asked another therapist to clear the table and the surroundings. The child cried for 16 seconds without tears and then stopped the behavior. The whole episode was three minutes, 26 seconds. Now, this seems impossible to do with the, every child all over, right? But now, with ABA, anything is possible. Ask the team who works in ABA. This is how we work. Everything is scientifically proven. Every minute detail is recorded. There's no guesswork in ABA. Now, with all this data, what do we do? We analyze this data. We put it into graphs like these, like how you see on the top, the ABC data analysis. By the way, this is, uh, this is like real data taken from one of the kids that I work with in my caseload. So these are the behaviors that the child has, pulling hair, crying, grabbing, screaming, vomiting, um, hitting self, pushing, pinching, mouthing, scratching. And again, against it on um, the, the bottom part where you have the table, it's written, what is the function? Access, escape, attention, and automatic. How many times did the child do each behavior and for what reason? This has been taken consistently for two weeks back to back. So we know exactly the function. Again, which setting does the child do it in? So you see 43, I'm sorry, the body part is not there. It's classroom. Okay, the child has major behaviors in the classroom, but he also has it in the playground. He has it in the hallway and he has it in the music room as well. Now, because it's highest in the classroom, again, the last graph on the bottom right, um, <coughs> excuse me, on the bottom right, um, what frequency of behaviors happens most in the classroom? Having a clear, detailed analysis of all of this gives us a clear idea. This child is going to do this behavior at this place with this level of intensity. So what can we do to change certain factors before this behavior happens? The magic basically happens with the antecedent interventions. Changing the antecedent so there is no history of the child engaging in that particular behavior and changing and teaching the child the appropriate way in the antecedent is the first step that we always take. Now, what happens with all of this? Again, it goes into a pie chart. What do we do with this? Okay, so for automatic, what all does he do? He pulls the hair. So automatic is sensory. Um, dealing with something that falls in automatic is a little bit of a higher challenge than dealing with all other three. So uh, for easy explanation, let me go to access, escape, or attention. Let's look at access. Um, if the child wants something, What's the most natural way to ask for something, for access for something? Ask for it, right? So instead of asking, what does this child do? He scratches, he pulls the air, he, hit, he screams, he cries, he pinches, he puts things in his mouth instead of asking. So this gives us a clear data. What's going to happen? How do we change it? Now, once we have this detailed ABC, we start defining behaviors. Because if we say this child cried, one child might cry with a loud noise and no tears. The other child might cry silently with tears. The other child might just, you know, sulk in a corner. Maybe that's his form of crying. And if I'm going to take data, and Abdul Aziz is going to take data, and Dr. Suleiman is going to take data on the same child without defining the behavior, we're going to be taking data on different stuff. And that's not how ABA works. So we define the behavior to the dot. So for example, if we say crying, any instance when the child cries with or without tears for attention, attention. Episode starts when child starts crying and ends when there is an absence of crying for crying behavior for 30 seconds. And we provide an example and a non-example. So this, the detail, even the details, intricate details, like you start the timer when the child starts crying. And even if he stopped, you're not gonna stop this timer. You're gonna wait for 30 seconds. And if the child does not cry for 30 seconds also, you stop the timer. So everybody takes consistent, accurate data across people, across setting, across times, across days, across locations. Now, uh, once we have all this information, we have the, the behavior intervention protocol. 
This is what we share with parents. So we have to get parents approval before we start anything to do with the bits. So the same bit, for example, this is just uh, a screenshot of part of the uh, part of the bit. The bit is sometimes very extensive, something as extensive as 10 to 15 pages. So if the child has a behavior SIB, self-injurious behavior of biting himself, why does he do it? He does it for access and for escape. What do we know as the antecedent? Any preferred item or edible insight, he's going to start biting himself. So you need to keep this in mind. What can we do before the behavior happens? DRA, manding, manding basically means asking, asking in a way that the child can ask, um, providing praise for keeping nice hands and a quiet mouth, a visual reminder. Remember, you need to keep a calm body and a quiet mouth until we finish this. And once we finish this, you are going to get what you want. Um, tolerate denied access programs and token board, all these are antecedent interventions. And exactly what do you do if he bites himself? So first thing is always safety. So you're going to follow the protocol um, handling for bite release. Again, each APA therapist will be trained on how to release a bite hold. Uh, then you're going to prompt the child to man. Once the child, man, and you're going to show, remember, we're going to keep a calm body, a quiet mouth. And when there is an absence of target behavior, which is the self introduced behavior for crying for 30 seconds or more, you are going to reinforce the child with what the child wants. Again, focus on absence of crying behavior. So what happens if I give the child what he wants when he continues to cry? He's going to, yes, he's going to think that, oh, it's my crying that got me what I want, right? So which is why we wait for an absence of 30 seconds before we prompt the child to man. So we're gonna be like, um, he wants the mouse, mouse. He's gonna say, mm, a mouse or mama, ma, ma, whatever he can. And then immediately we're like, there you go, there's the mouse. So we are breaking the connection between the crying changing it to something appropriate for money, then we're going to deliver what the child wants. This way, when it is done consistently over different people, different locations, the child's finally going to get, oh, biting myself or crying or screaming is not going to get me what I want. The next part, assessments. There are so many assessments out there. I just want to can I get a fair idea? How many of you here are in the field of ADA, like from this room? Nobody? Right there. Yeah, I know. I, I know Aziz and I know uh, you as well. Two of you are here, maybe, right? yeah. or three of us. And then everybody else is the medical field, right? Okay, just to know what extent I need to explain it in time. Um, so here, this is what each of the grids that you see, like one to five, each of these grids actually means something. Like, for example, if you see man, man is asking for what you want. One is asking for two preferred items. So if you see the blocks in red, shows us that the child already has these skills. The blocks in yellow are the skills that we're gonna target for to teach the child in the next one year. Um, a barriers grid, barriers to his growth. What are his problem behaviors? How are we gonna deal with it? Uh, this is just a assessment. Based on the assessment, we create detailed assessment plan, detailed individualized treatment plan, another one called AFILS. Um, all of them will kind of look the same, like different grids with multiple colors. It looks very beautiful, but it's much more complicated than just pure beauty. Now, the numbers. This is a language we all understand in common. How do we know whether this works? There you go. That's where we do this part. So this graph actually shows two behaviors. One is flopping and the other one is duration of crying. We will go, if you see session one to seven, okay, it's up and down, up and it's, it's just down. And then all of a sudden there was a spike. And then what did we do next? So we had introduced OT and music for this child. And then what happened? Eight, nine, 10 was fine, but there it goes all over the place. The behaviors just escalated all over the place. And then it came down. Then what did we do next? We started music intervention um, has been run consistently. And when we started consistently running music interventions, it's more or less okay, he's tolerated the OT. Similarly, if you look at duration of crying, you would see graphs. So this is how we do every change that happens with the child. We study it scientifically, see what's happening. Did this change help the child? Did this change not help the child? What is it that happened that created such a ruckus? Or what, what started his standards? How do we fix it? This analysis goes on. Another one, again, we don't work alone. 
ABA never works alone. We have a part of speech with us. We also have a part of OT with us, but we never work alone. We have a collaborative approach. So how do we help with speech? We take intricate data. We tell them exactly how many times did the child ask for, how many items did he ask for? Um, did he ask for it independently or did I have to prompt him? Did I have to prompt him and help him say it partially? Every detail we take and we provide. The same with toileting. It's something that we also deal with the same way. Um, you know, U, U plus means successful void in the toilet. UA is urinary accident. BM plus is bowel movement in the toilet. BMA is bowel movement accidents. In ABA, we eat, breathe, sleep, data. All the time, there's only data. Stereotyping. This is something we help OT with. So you know children with motor and vocal stereotypical actions, some of it, yeah, all the time, and, and all this blah, 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 sounds that they make all the time. That's vocal stereotypy because the function is sensory. How can we help here? How do we help the OT therapist? Data. If you see this child, we've not had much progress. It started from 2019. That year we didn't have progress, but in 2022 we've had much, much, much more progress because a lot of things had changed. Um, this graph is highly variable. It clearly tells us that we, we, we can't draw any conclusion out of it, but we share this data with our OT therapist and our um, uh, and a physiotherapist. So they are like, they have a clear idea. Is it working? It's not a guesswork where we say, oh yes, OT is working, physiotherapy is working. Mm, no, we need to change our tactic. Look at the graph, it, it, don't think it's working. <laughs> or maybe let's try this one out. Or maybe they would say, can you send your ABA therapist? Let's try it together. Anything that we do in ABA would most probably be a collaborative, collaborative approach. How do we carry this forward? This is one question that everybody asks us. Oh, the child is great at the center. There is, or, or maybe sometimes the parents say, I see no progress. I see no progress. He's still screaming the place down. Why? Because you haven't trained him at home. We're only training him at the center. So this child learns that at the center or maybe in school, I behave this way. I cannot behave the other way because it's not going to work. But I go home, I throw a tantrum there. Yeah, mom's going to give in or dad's going to give in. Or I go and kick or break all the eggs in the fridge. Things are going to work. I had a similar case like that. This child would wake up at three o'clock in the morning, go down to the fridge, open the fridge and break all the eggs possible. Mom comes running down and mom gives him all the attention that he needs. So his breaking egg had multiple functions. So one, his mom would come down, give him all the attention, ask, oh my God, baby, why are you doing this? Don't do this, baby, all this one. This is what he wanted. Second, she would take other stock, extra stock of eggs out. And when she does that, she opens the cupboard, which has access to his skittles. So he's the, he's the skittle, breaks a couple of eggs more. So mom's like, oh baby, you wanted skittles? You can use your wives, you don't have to do this. And she gives him the skittles. So he doesn't change anything at home, but he changes in the center. The only way we can bring about progress in a child is by doing consistently the same thing we do at the center and at home. How do we do it? Nanny or parent training. Once we have a steady graph, then we call parents over or we call nannies over. If it's nannies, the one who's mostly with the child, we train them to carry out the bit exactly the way we do it here. And then that's when the changes keep happening. We train in different settings. Sometimes we go home, observe them over there at home, suggest what to do over there, train parents at home, train nannies at home. So they know what to do because we don't have the same setting that they have at home. Like, especially for this child, we had to be there to watch what exactly was happening. We went in, we showed them what to do. But the moment that I was there physically, he didn't do any of this. Rather than screaming or yelling, early in the morning, he just came and called and said, Miss Nancy, I want some eggs, please. Done. It's done. And I want skittles. It was done. So this is how we train at home and behavior management in external settings. Like, for example, he goes to the store, toy store. It's a mess. He will throw everything around. He will go to the cashier, pull out this, pull out that. We go to the center. We start training them at a prototype, a prototype Zoom market or prototype market of a shop that we have nearby. And then we take them outside. And then we are there with them, helping them slowly and steadily and teaching them how to cope. Now, how do parents know what we do? So we have multiple applications that we can use. One of them is Hyrasmus. There's Rethink. Uh, there are a lot of them. 
but one of them is high rises where parents can watch live trainings if it is at the center. So doing something like that builds the trust with parents because at any point of time, they can peek in and see what's happening in school. They know we're doing the right thing. They know kids are there, kids are watching. Um, so that's about ABA. Also, since we are all here, I just wanted to say we do have free screenings at Sun at this time. Do not take it like um, just a screening. You all of you are welcome and we could give you a tour and show you the facilities that we have. You could bring over some of the ideas. You know, we always learn from each other. You could come just to visit us. Just call me and let me know you're coming for a visit. We'll show you what we have. Maybe we could learn from each other. Take, bring a couple of things here to Abu Dhabi from what you see there and probably teach us a bit more of what you do. So it's more or less, you know, give and take. Like I always say to everybody, it takes a lot of extra sparkle to touch special minds. And if they cannot learn the way, the way we teach, then we teach them the way we can. So that's all about the presentation today. I hope that you've got a little more light into ABA. For sure, you've got specialists here but a little more light into how we work at Salat Village and how ABA literally works. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I think the floor is open to questions. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you for your presentation. It was so wonderful. But I have a question, uh, like, uh, like it is a conception that ABA is kind of a robotic mm -hmm. for the patient. So how you would look at it? And the other question is like, for example, a child who is impulsive and having no you know idea of like having a very poor risk evaluation for dangers mm -hmm. so how aba therapy can help because here we are using role plays modeling and other strategies of behavior therapy yep. but i want to know more about <coughs> AB. Thank more you. about ab how ab can help for this Okay, so to answer your first question, is ABA robotic? No, ABA is not, because you're talking about DTT or discrete trial training. Discrete trial training is where ABA becomes extremely robotic. So that's where you set things up in a particular way without changing anything around. So the child can um, child can bring you can bring about the correct answer in a child. But the other part is called the NET, the natural environment teaching. And that's what we promote mostly. This is a huge misconception. And thank you so much, Amna, for actually pointing this out and giving me the opportunity to clarify this. DTT is only given to children who need DTT. NET or natural environment teaching is how we, in ABA, we generally teach children. So for example, if the child is playing around a ball, having access of the ball that he's going to, holding it up, prompting him to say ball or b or any other, maybe signing or even exchanging a picture, and then giving him what he wants. ABA is mainly focused on NET or child-led learning. So please uh, do not think ABA is robotic because ABA is not robotic. We provide DTT only for those children who require DTT. It's again, child-specific. The second question that you asked, um, risk-taking behavior or bringing about an awareness of risk. Now I can give you a lot of vague uh, vague answers and give you certain strategies, but I would not do that because I need to know the history of the child. I need to know why a child does what he does. So for you, what you perceive as risk-taking behavior might not be risk-taking behavior once we have ABC data. So if you have specific details about the child, you have my details here, you have my email ID, you also have my phone number. You can always reach out to me, give me more details about the child, give me more details about the ABC, Give me ABC data and I'll tell you exactly how to deal with it. Would that be okay, Amna? Sure. Uh, I would, as I said, that it is like about a child who is impulsive, you know, kind yes, of having yes, ADHD. Yes, so yes, uh, yes, yes. I can totally understand that you really need to know the whole context. Yes, also, I need to know the context. Yeah, yeah. But uh, like my question is like role playing, we are giving role playing, modeling behaviors to the, like, you know, to the child. So is it yeah, like you will consider it using as ABA or it would be different? Like, Behavior therapy is part, like AB is a part of behavior therapy. So how you would look at it? Behavior therapy and AB is kind of the same, but it's not yeah. cognitive behavior therapy, yes. Yes. So yes. let's take up this case separately because this is a very specific case and we have uh, limitations to what we discuss sure. in public about a client. You have my details, please reach out to me and uh, we can discuss further on that. Sure, sure, thank you for answering. You're welcome, you're welcome. Nancy, we have another two people want to ask questions. Yes, hello. Uh, 
or you ask the questions, uh, some of our staff have something to do. Feel free to let go if you have something to do. People who want to learn something more, you can stay. Everyone want to learn. But I know. I understand yeah. perfectly. <laughs> You have, you can escape. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> Ahmed, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Ahmed, hello? Yes, please, I have a question. In uh, behavior intervention plan, yeah, you write uh, DRA in incident intervention. I yes. think it should be in uh, consequences intervention. Yes or no? Um, yes and no. So DRA is differential reinforcement of alternate behavior, right? So um, if we put DRA as mandating, if you teach the child how to ask for the things before the child gets into a behavior, then it falls into an intervention. If you do DRA after the child gets, uh, does the consequence, then it falls into consequence in, um, intervention. So your question is valid. It falls into both, yes. So when you see the consequence that I have sent, I have again said verbally prompt the child to mount and differentially reinforce the child in consequence as well. Does that answer your question, Ahmed? No, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, just I want to say thank you, Ms. Nancy, for this presentation. And uh, I want to ask for this presentation, it will be shared with us or no? We just like this. Uh, if Ms. Nancy does not object uh, to that, we'll be very happy to no uh, share it with you guys. No objection. You know, by all means, please go ahead and share. Sure. We probably will add it to the YouTube, and then uh, people who registered in here will send them a link, and they can access it at any time they want. We have a lot of materials in our YouTube network that people can read. Most of it really is not about uh, mental health. Uh, but uh, some other stuff, but there is a lot of the lectures in different, you know, psychiatry, psychology, uh, speech, uh, occupation, uh, lectures in our uh, network. Any other question from you guys here? Any yeah. other question in the line? Yes, there's one question in the chat. Uh, it's Dr. Dal Suri asking, are your service covered by insurance? No, ABA is not covered directly under insurance and uh, uh, people who need to do it. However, sometimes like a psychologist, they will do some EBA part of their work or something like that. It will be as a session, but it's not gonna be like, like, yeah, it will not be what she showed us here with this diagram and progress and rewarding and taking and all of these kind of things. I'm so amazed by the work guys, you, you know, my question to you, you know, how do we decide the link? You know, we, because he mentioned the money. Yes. And we are asking the parents uh, uh, two major questions. How long and how much? How, how many hours per week? Mm -hmm. This is the two, probably three parents will ask you how many hours per week mm -hmm. or per month mm -hmm. and how much it will cost. Let's say that we're, we're not going to talk about that. Of course, we'll talk about it later. But how, how do we evaluate the success? How do we know we are doing the right thing? Okay. Uh, thank you. People are paying cash. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. So to answer your question, the multiple parts. Once the child comes in, we have four to eight weeks of detailed assessment. So the, what do we do in this detailed assessment is understand what his skills are, understand the grasp at which he can learn, how fast can he learn. We call it trials to master. So we will have to wait for sure, at least once we start the program for at least three months, because by then we will have clear data to show how many trials to mastery. So once we get the data of this, that shows us, okay, his social skills are improving at this rate. Probably he will only need it for this much more time or um, his skills, uh, it's, it's very slow, we cannot say. So the safest answer that we always tell a parent is to please be very patient. You have access to the data. You can see what is happening. Um, you know how fast he is learning or how fast he is learning. Sure, she's not learning, or you see the behavior is interfering, and then we check trials to master. That will give us a clear idea. Can I add one question? Example, you said start 2019 and it's followed in 2014, yes. which means that three years, and uh, it seems that it will continue only also. Yeah. So this is lifelong, or what? I mean, no. So again, um, I like your question, very smart also doctor. So 2019, this is basically his sensory issue. 
His sensory issue is something that is primarily targeted in OT and also as a sub of ABA. So his and this child is actually 12 years old. This child has been having this behavior. In 2019, he was 12 years old. So he, this is a behavior that he's had for 12 years, reinforced over and over and over and again. And from 2019 to 2022, it's only been three years. You've not seen the recent graph because I'm not at the liberty to share recent graphs. So if you check the recent graph, it is on the downward curve. So for example, his behavior was drumming on the table like this all the time. How did we change it? We started, if you see music intervention was started, right? So we started putting in keyboards, started teaching him music, started teaching him to drum. Now, rather than making all these voices, he drums. He drums, it's called, uh, it's a very traditional equipment. It's called tabla, it's a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. He drums the tabla and he plays the keyboard. So this has been changed to this. But the only problem is you hear music in the middle of the night and yeah. that's okay, that's still okay. So he's walking in a mall. Rather than him going and slamming on every every glass, he has the keyboard that's hung over here. He takes it, he plays it, and walks. Again, more appropriate than him drumming on the wall. So yes, there has been progress, but in this case, the progress was slow and steady. It was very slow. Yes, I agree. So there is no time period. ABA cannot work magic like um, a medicine can do. If you have a fever, you take a medicine, the fever goes down, right, gradually. But that doesn't work with ABA. It doesn't, it doesn't work that fast. You need to be patient. You need to see the graph. You need to see how a child uh, responds to our treatment. And that's when we can say. Can I, can I ask, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, clarifying things. Um, now, you have, uh, you know, a PCPA, which is uh, you, Red as well. And we have the ABA. How often you work with each other? What do you do for them? What do they do for you? For RBDs or ABA yeah, sessions? Yeah. Okay. So a BCBA or a BCBAD are the only people, BCABA, BCBAD, and BCBA are the only qualifications who can design the program. We analyze the data that is collected by junior therapists and RBTs, and we design the program. Like for example, <coughs> um, brushing teeth. Well, the parents are asking help to teach a child how to brush his teeth. How do you design the program? Maybe the child uses the, um, you know, the form toothpaste. Designing the steps for it. How many times are we going to apply this? What prompt or help will we give in each step? All is prescribed by the BCBA. And then this is being carried out by the registered behavior technicians or by junior ABA therapists who are again working towards any qualifications like IBT, QBT, or RBT. So as a BCABA, BCBA, and BCBAD, we design and we provide the programs and uh, the plan and the RBTs, IBTs, or the QBTs implement what we provide. So how, how when you're gonna come back to what you start, we give them the program today, when you're gonna come back and look at it again, uh, is it within a week, within a month, within a year? How, how uh, what is the best okay. reasonable? Yes. Uh, because I assume the PCPA person is gonna be monitoring few people. Yes. Yes. And uh, with that, you're not gonna be able to spend the daily no. with the same day, even weekly probably. Mm -hmm. What is it? Is it monthly, if you four months, if you three months? How do you decide? Okay, so for this, there are a lot of things that actually help us. This is where the app plays a major role also nowadays. So basically when it comes to anything to do with mandate or asking or behaviors, we consider a two weeks time because we cannot ask teach a child to mandate two days or three days. So a two weeks time over generally over two weeks is for any behaviors and any mandating related program provided that there is no hiccups. By hiccups, I mean, when we start an intervention, it's very common that a child is going to have massive behaviors. That's common. That's where we have the first week for. Even in the second week, there is absolutely no reduction or variation in graph, then that means there's a problem in the intervention that we said. So in that case, we would always go in, like especially when an intervention starts, we would be going in at least every three or four days just to make sure that it's it's okay, yes, the behaviors are rising, but that's expected, no problem, it's an extinction burst. The behaviors are going down, okay, maybe it's starting to work. <clears throat> but basically after two weeks of mandating and behavior is when we actually check. Now the apps help us in another way. Each target, the moment it is mastered or the child has learned it, the app keeps popping it up. 
At the same time, if the child is not able to master or learn it at the step that we have uh, asked them to, for example, um, we're trying to make the child point to the picture of a balloon. And we're saying balloon, and we are, we are helping full-fledged balloon, 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 multiple times, multiple days, and it's still not progressing, the app gives us a sign. You know, it, it stays in red or it gives us a pop-up. This is another way in which we know, okay, this one, is it only this target? Or is it the whole skill of indicating that the child cannot do? Where is the major block that we are having? That's when we look into it. But to some so you have question, to be, uh, you have to participate in this app, you have to buy it, correct? Yes, you need to buy it. Not just this app, a lot of apps that you can do. So it depends on your organization, the strength of your people, you decide which app you want to go for. Okay, I'll ask the last question. How do you deal with different, you know, we are in a different culture, yeah. uh, different language. Mm -hmm. How do you decide which, you know, let's say I speak English and I speak Arabic and they have patients who maybe speak some or hear some. How do you decide which, which way? You can go? Which language? Or yeah, let's say you are multi-talented and you have a, a thousand languages. What you're going to choose for your child? So here is where we will have to solely rely on parents because there are parents who would come in and say, I want my child to communicate in Arabic, or I want my child to communicate in English. Now we will heed and respect a parent's decision, but at the same time, if we see that the child has more inclination, again, it will be over two to three weeks where we get it, no matter how we are pointing in Arabic, probably the child is manual back in English. At that time, we have enough data and scientific evidence to show parents. We will meet with parents, discuss with them, and tell them, look, this is how it's going. They still want us to push, we will still try. But again, we will come back with more data. And uh, basically, like whenever we go with scientific data, like all these 11 years, I've never had a problem when we go with scientific data and we tell parents, this is why. Because any parent only wants the best for their child. So as long as the child can communicate, they're happy the way the child communicates. Uh, there are some parents who are adamant, no sign language. Absolutely no sign language, don't teach sign language to my child. Those are authentic stuff which we will consider and we will try routing. Again, if we face an issue, we will get back to them, but with data. So it works with data. Uh, one question may be related to last question, uh, Dr. Suleiman. Related, you are uh, intervening with children in individual level. Yes. We are looking at uh, wider context like family, culture. Suppose that put children to learn by imitation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Seeing the parents playing the mm -hmm. this is different from Western, the tone of culture. Yes, yes. So you have uh, another wider perspective. Yes, we do. Like family, family therapists maybe they have the room. Yes, yes, definitely, Doc. Thank you for asking that question. It is always the family who decides on how we want a particular task that's thought. So once, this is why we have an individualized treatment plan, ITP, or individualized education plan. Now, this is usually discussed with parents. I can give you a simple example of toileting or cleaning yourself after toileting. In Western culture, they like using tissues. In Arab culture or the Asian culture, we use a water hose. So these are things that we always check with parents. What would you prefer? Would you prefer this? Then they would tell us, yes, this. So the program that's designed is made on what the parents request is. Sometimes they already have therapists residing with them at home. And then we work in collaboration with the therapist. So we share our goals. They say what they want. We share our goals and we constantly go in and train them or we observe them on Zoom when they're running sessions and we interfere that way. Um, there are some parents who come and say, no, I want my child to learn Arabic. I want my child to read the Quran. Um, and that's, that, that is also respected because that's your culture and your tradition. And we always go the way the family goes. Because ultimately, when you think of it, the child's not going to be at the center forever. He's going to go out. And where is he going to be with? With his family or with his relative in that culture, in that tradition. So yes, that is a huge part of all the decision making that we do. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, you Ms. Nancy. Thank, thank you. Very really much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very nice uh, presentation. And I'm so amazed that we learned from uh, Ms. Rada and from you. And you're going to be more uh, guests with us, both of you guys, again and again. And uh, we will see how we can improve this area, which is, I believe, it's far, far underutilized uh, in the whole community of patients, with, especially with autistic children. Yes.